The speaker of the hour is Brother Trent Thrasher. Trent serves as the local evangelist at the 14th and Main Church of Christ in Big, Big Spring, Texas, where he has served since January of 2023. Prior to this time, Trent has filled, on, filled the pulpit on an interim basis <clears throat> at the Park Street Church of Christ in Olathe, Kansas. He has spoken in multiple lectureship and held several gospel meetings in such locations as Kansas, Missouri, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Texas. Trent has been active with the Online Academy of Biblical Studies in, in the past as the IT director and also serves as, has served uh, as interim administrative director before Chuck Northrup took over in 2019. Trent and his wife Leah have been married for 15 years and have three children, Lydia, Scar Scarlett, and Samuel. Trent's topic is, if I were young again, Brother Trent. Well, Y'all don't laugh at my topic title, all right? <laughs> I still consider myself young, contrary to what some may think or believe. But I do appreciate uh, the topic. It is always a joy and a privilege to be able to be invited to come and to speak at the Midwest Lectureship. Uh, I believe since 2018 I've been able to speak on it, and I always count it a joy. It's such a good time as I look uh, across at the audience, so many faces that I know and have known for years, known my family for years, and I love and appreciate all of you. I certainly uh, love this congregation for her good elders, for uh, her deacons, for her members, and appreciate this congregation for continuing to have this lectureship for the amount of years that she has, and would encourage her to continue to do so as it's always an uplifting time. In Psalm 37, in verse number 25, David writes these words, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And if we all live long enough, and the Lord doesn't return again, we will see old age. Now man's lifespan is short in totality, but especially when you put that in respect to eternity. James in James chapter 4 and verse number 14 describes our life as a vapor, that it appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. It's like that steam off your morning coffee. It doesn't last very long. Seventy to eighty years is what Moses wrote in Psalm 90 and verse number 10. That's our general life expectancy. And if you look at the average life expectancy of both men and women, it falls between that 70 and 80 year range. As I look across the audience, there are some that have not yet reached half of that lower limit. There are some that are getting close to the lower limit. There are some that are within the range, and there are some that are on borrowed time. As we understand, our life is short. But I'm not talking about just life in general. We're talking about if I was young again. So when I consider youth, youth is a subset of that lifespan. And it can be utilized either for good or squandered with evil. But one thing is for certain. Glorifying the past is a foolish proposition. That is what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 10. And sometimes we do that. We think about what we call the good old days or the glory years. But if you really were able to put yourself back at that point in time, you'd realize you had a lot of problems back then and things weren't as good as you really remember them to be. And as such, we need to be careful that we don't glorify the past. However, looking back to examine pitfalls, areas where we made mistakes, areas where we sinned, areas where I shouldn't have done that, being able to examine those areas and to warn future generations is of benefit. And generally speaking, we have all done things in our youth that we wish we hadn't. In fact, in Psalm 25 and verse number 7, David there would say, Remember not the transgressions of my youth. He didn't want God to remember those. But thankfully, I believe Brother Zach brought this point out as he had his sermon yesterday, God has given us a book. So regardless of what age I am, I can have the wisdom from the ancient of days that's all sufficient for all of our needs, whatever age we may be. 
Y'all need some scripture for that. Second Peter chapter one and verse number three, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we understand in second Timothy chapter three, verses 16 and 17, that all scripture is inspired by God. It's given by God It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Note this, that the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That means this book right here is all sufficient for all things in life. In fact, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 119. Every single verse in this particular psalm really dealing with the word of God. And note what the psalmist here says beginning in verse 99 of Psalm 119. He says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients. You look at a way you could translate that word ancients, elders, those who are older in age. Why? Because I keep thy precepts. So I can understand more than the ancients, more than those who have learned through experience by looking at God's word and thus heeding the warnings that are there and doing what it says so that I can avoid making those mistakes. Now, depending on how old you are, We've all likely wanted to get into the proverbial time machine and warn ourselves of some past danger. But alas, we cannot do that. Contrary to what some of the movies would have you to believe, you can't make a time machine out of a DeLorean. Doesn't work that way. No such thing as the flux capacitor. But what if I was young again? What would I change? What would I be involved in or with? How would I utilize my youth? Point number one, if you're taking notes, if I was young again, I would remember now my creator. Now, Solomon was a very wise man. We understand that as he takes the throne from his father, David, as David uh, is going to die and he is the next anointed king, that God appeared to Solomon in a dream and asked him, what will I give you? What, what do you want me to give to you, Solomon? And you'll remember that he asked for wisdom. He asked for a wise and a discerning heart by which he could rule and govern the people. And God granted him that and a whole lot more. First Kings chapter number three, verses five through twelve. This particular man spake three thousand proverbs, one thousand and five songs. First Kings four thirty two. And he also wrote a book, the book of Ecclesiastes, which I'd invite you to turn to. Ecclesiastes is a very practical book, one of my favorite books of the Bible. We understand he wrote it from chapter 1 and verse 1, where there he writes the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. But as he neared the end of this book, in chapter number 12 and verse number 1, look at what Solomon here wrote. He says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And if you're wondering what the evil days are, all you got to do is keep reading. Oh, when you can't see, when you start bending over because your back can't support you, when your arms and hands and your legs start to tremble and your teeth fall out and your hair turns white. Those are the days he's talking about. He's talking about an old age. Well, some of y'all are laughing about that. Nevertheless, that's what Solomon's talking about. We know he is because at the end, verse number seven, he talks about the dust returning to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So he's talking about that aging process. But he says, remember, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Why is that so important? Because in our youth, we must know that God is real and that he is the creator of all things. Why is that so important today? Because depending upon where youth are going to school, they're getting force-fed a doctrine that is completely false. They're getting force-fed evolution. They're getting force-fed that you only came from natural processes. That at some point in time, way long ago, we climbed out of the primordial slime and everything that you see today is just the product of random chance and naturalistic only processes. That's false. And I know it's false because God created us. Genesis chapter number one. And he created us good. Verse number 31 of that same chapter. We understand that the word was there in the beginning. That there wasn't anything made that was made without him. John chapter number 1 and verse number 3. We understand that to be a reference to the second person of the Godhead. As it's further fleshed out in Colossians 1. Verses 16 and 17. There is a God in heaven. And he is our creator. 
And that is so important for our youth to understand. That is so important as parents that we teach our children that you are made in the image of God. That life has sanctity. That it must be protected. And that it is not okay no matter what age a particular human being is to murder it. And so we need to teach them that. But it follows as well that if God is the creator and he is, he is also the judge. If you're still in Ecclesiastes, back up to chapter number 11 and look at verse number 9. He says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things, what does he say next? God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh for childhood and youth are vanity. Vanity, one of those common words in the book of Ecclesiastes. Not one thing escapes the all seeing eye of God. In fact, as he ends this book in chapter 12 and verse 14, he says, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In Proverbs chapter 5 and verse number 21, it talks about God's eyes pondering the ways of man. It talks about God understanding and knowing what man is doing. In fact, in Proverbs 15 and verse number 3, God's eyes are beholding the good and the evil. You know, that is either a comforting or a terrifying thought, depending on what side of the fence you are on. But it also follows, as we looked at in verse 1 of chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, now is the time to remember God. When should I remember God? Now, he says. Now. With time and especially youth being short, we have no time to waste. You know, sometimes we fall into that trap thinking, well, uh, I just got some time to burn. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't have time to burn. Youth is fleeting. It's fast. God must be on our minds at a very young age and continue to be throughout our lives. So what does that look like? I invite you to go to 1 Timothy chapter number 4 with me as we move over into the New Testament. Now, Paul wrote to Timothy, and it's believed to be he was around 40 years of age. You might say his later 30s as well, and he still called him a youth. I find that encouraging. And so in 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 13, this is what the Apostle Paul tells Timothy. Now note, this is at a time when the New Testament is still being revealed, but look at what he's encouraging Timothy to do. He says, till I come, give attendance, take focus upon reading, exhortation, and doctrine. I need you, Timothy, to continue to read. Do you have a reading plan? You know, one of the things uh, we do with our children, uh, reading is so important. We teach them to read, and part of what they read is the Bible. And as such, we need to read. One of the things that will help you with your reading is a reading plan. Get a reading plan. Stick to it. Hold yourself to it. You're going to grow and increase in spiritual knowledge. We need that. And as such, he needed to give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. But reading alone is not sufficient. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15, he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so study must also be involved, giving diligence. It's going to take more than just reading, reading a part of that, but we'll have to dig into the text. You know, I can speak and maybe it embarrass her, not my intention to embarrass her. I have a daughter that studies the Bible. I'm not talking about just reading it. She gets out her blue letter Bible and she studies the Bible every day single day it is possible to do that in your youth and i'm proud of her and i encourage her and all to do that her knowledge is just off the charts put some of those that have been in the church for many years to shame i dare say and as such we need to give diligence if you go back to first timothy chapter number four look at what else the apostle paul tells timothy in verse 15 he says meditate upon these things oh if reading is the ingestion of God's word. Meditation is the digestion of God's word. And as such, we need to mull those things over in our mind. What does God mean by this? And put in the work to figure it out. Paul says, give thyself wholly or completely to them that thy profiting may appear to all. It's not going to be something that's hidden. You'll be able to see it. I appreciate Brother Randy for leading that song. And that song actually comes from Psalm 119. If you back up to Psalm 119, look at verse number 9. How is a young person 
going to cleanse their way. In Psalm 119 and verse 9, the psalmist says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. I believe verse 11 is a teaching of the importance of memorization of God's word. Not only are we reading and studying and meditating, we're putting it into our minds and mulling it over so that we can pull it out at the right time and make sure that when we're tempted, just like Jesus was, we can say it is written and we got book, chapter and verse for it. Our youth can do that. Their minds are so sharp. But we also need to remember God now by spending time in prayer. Three short words, but oh so powerful words. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17, pray without ceasing. Youth can pray. We need to teach them how to pray. Pray properly. Praying to the Father in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Show them that there is a God in heaven and that He loves you and He cares for you. And you need to spend much time in prayer to Him. Jesus was always praying to the Father as you go throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially Luke's record. And show them we need to be spending time in prayer. In Romans 12 and verse number 12, being instant in prayer, giving dedicated effort. And sometimes worry can creep in. If you look over at Philippians chapter number 4, if you ever struggle with worry, and we all do from time to time, look at what the Apostle Paul here writes to the Philippians. Philippians 4 and verse 6, he says, Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't worry for anything. But in everything, what would that exclude? Nothing. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, might I say, always have thanksgiving in your prayer. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep or guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, in remembering my Creator, I must also fear Him. Point number two. If I was young again, I would fear the Lord. Now, let's talk about the aspect of fear that causes problems. In fact, is sinful. Because that type of fear is absolutely crippling to the cause of Christ. If you turn over in your Bibles to Revelation chapter number 21, I want you to look at this list of individuals who will find themselves in the lake of fire and brimstone. That's a bad lake. I don't want to be in that lake. But note the first one on the list in Revelation 21 and verse number 8 is the fearful, the timid, the cowardly. Now that type of fear is going to cause us not to stand up for the cause of Jesus Christ, and that's why it's sinful. That's why it's wrong. I'm not afraid of what man can do to me. Why? Because I'm on the Lord's side. And I know that type of fear is not what God has given us because that's exactly what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 7. Evidently, this young preacher struggled a little bit with timidity, struggled a little bit with cowardice. And as such, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 7, he says, for God had not given us the spirit of fear, but note these things that he has given us of power, of love and of a sound mind, the ability to exercise prudence and self-discipline. So when I understand I'm on God's side and I have his word, I can pick up the sword of the spirit, come what may from Satan and his minions. But when I think about fear, particularly in youth, it can certainly transfer into adulthood. One of those forms of fear that impacts youth is that of peer pressure. Oh, everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is involved in this particular sin. What are you going to do as a young person? I'm going to stand up for the cause of Christ. And I need to be careful with who I spend my time with. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, Paul said, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. I need to surround myself with the proper environment. I need to be reminded of what Moses wrote in Exodus 23 and verse number 2. That I don't want to follow a multitude to do evil. That I don't want to be thinking such that I rest or twist judgment. And friends, that is a problem in society today. There is a lot of pressure put on our youth, not only in the school system, but it's invited in through the means of a phone and social media. I'll have more to say about that a little bit later on as it relates to the phone and the internet. But I don't want to leave us with so many negatives because fear can be overcome in youth. I think about David. You remember David? He was the youngest of eight, the son of Jesse. And here is this giant of a man 
Goliath, the Philistine, who was defying the armies of the living God and the men that should have been men and standing up and dealing with that weren't. They were cowering in fear, as was Saul. And so David listens to this and says, why isn't anybody doing anything about this? As I'm basically paraphrasing it. And as such, he was chastised, but he reminded Saul, look, I'm a shepherd. And when a lion came out and took a sheep, and a bear came out and took a sheep, I took him by his beard and I took care of him. I killed those wild animals, those scary animals. He said, this uncircumcised Philistines will be just like one of them. He was a youth at that point in time. He wasn't afraid. Why? Because he knew he was on God's side. And God delivered that giant into his hand. So instead of fearing man, who can only destroy our body, we need to fear God. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12 with me. I dare say, if you don't know anything else about Ecclesiastes, you know this verse. It's used often. I've been using it all year back at 14th and Main. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon, you did it all, and you've said vanity of vanities. So what's the conclusion? Here it is. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, really the whole of man. Man's all. This is why we are here on planet Earth, to fear God and to keep His commandments. Do you remember how this chapter began? Verse number one, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Though it is possible to fear God from our youth. You need a verse for that. First Kings chapter number 18 and verse number 12. Obadiah told Elijah as he had appeared and Ahab was looking all over for him. And he's starting to get a little bit concerned that uh, Elijah's not going to appear to Ahab and it's going to be Obadiah's head. And Obadiah reminded Elijah, I have feared God From my youth. Don't tell me you can't fear God from your youth. You can. We can obey God from our youth. Brother Zach, in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse number 14, as God told Ezekiel, I need you to make this special type of bread of certain ingredients, and I'm going to give you man's waste in order to cook that. I said, oh no, nothing defiled has touched these lips, even from my youth. I understand what the law of Moses is, and I've kept that from a young man, from a youth. In Psalm 71 and verse number 5, the psalmist said that he had trusted God from his youth. I wonder how he knew to trust God. Verse 17 tells us he was taught by God from our youth. Faith, trust in God, comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Evidently, he knew God's word. What happens when anyone does not fear the Lord? Go over to Psalm 36 with me. Psalm 36 is actually cited in the book of Romans, but let's get it from the book of Psalms. You want to know why people sin? The psalmist will tell us in Psalm 36 and verse number 1, he says, The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. He doesn't fear God. And as such, he sins. He doesn't care what God has to say. He doesn't care what God is doing. And as such, he sins. He violates the will of God. You know, one of the great dangers, particularly in youth, is thinking that nobody knows. Nobody's why. Nobody will know. Mom and dad don't know. But God always knows. Remember, we talked about the fact that God's eyes are everywhere, that he's always watching. He's omnipresent. And as such, we need to fear him. Let me talk just a little bit about the Internet. We need to be careful with the Internet. I don't care what age we are, but the fact that cell phones are more prevalent, they become cheaper, they're more accessible, and youth are getting those at an even younger age. We must realize that everything we put on the internet, and I mean everything, is being tracked, is being recorded, is being databased. That's the nature of the internet. It goes into duplicate and triplicate and quadruplicate, and you think you've deleted something, you haven't deleted it. I don't mean to scare us, but you can even take down a website, and at some point in time, Google or something has taken an archive of that website and a snapshot, and you can actually look at what it looked like X number of days or years ago. The Internet is paying attention. We need to be careful with how we're using that, with what we're putting on by that. And it can actually impact us in our adulthood as people go back in time and look at the timeline of our youth. And that can impact us as we age. 
So be careful with that. Oh, I wanted to get to this third point. When I preached this sermon back at 14th and Maine, I had to blast through this, but I got some time this morning. Praise be to God for that. So with the fear of the Lord comes the necessity, point number three, of fleeing youthful lusts. If I was young again, I would flee youthful lusts. This is what the Apostle Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. If you turn over in your Bibles there, look at what the Apostle Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 22. There he told this man, flee also youthful lust. He could have just said lust, but he said youthful lust. So we'll dig into that. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And as you're reading and as you're studying the Bible, it should prompt questions. So what does the Apostle Paul mean by youthful lust? What are youthful lusts? Well, I know for sure what they're not. I know that they are not righteousness, which derives from the word of God. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I know it's not faith which comes from the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. I know it's not charity or love, which we know that God is love, 1 John 4 and verse number 8, and that we show our love to him by doing what he says, John 14 and verse number 15. I know it's not peace, but I know that the gospel is the gospel of peace, Romans 10, 15. And I also know it's not related to purity. We already looked at Psalm 119 and verse number 9. How will a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to God's word. Every word of God is pure. It's purified. Proverbs 30 and verse number 5. So I know it's not related to that. So what are some youthful lusts which must be fled from? And as I racked my mind to pick out just a couple that we could look at this morning, this one rose to the top. One of those youthful lusts that seems to impact youth and then carries forward into life that causes oh so many problems is that of alcohol and other intoxicants. I invite you to turn to Proverbs chapter number 23 with me. Proverbs chapter number 23, and then we're going to move right over into the New Testament. I could have us go to Proverbs 20 and verse number 1, which says, Wine is a mocker, and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now when you approach that word wine, it is generic in both Hebrew and Greek, so you've got to look at the context to determine, are we dealing with alcoholic content or not? Well, it's very clear in Proverbs 20 and verse number 1, we are dealing with alcoholic content because it talks about deception. I have never once been deceived drinking Welch's grape juice. But if you intoxicate yourself, if you drink alcohol, deception is sure to happen. You're not only deceiving yourself, but you can easily be deceived. But I want to look at Proverbs 23 and the picture that it paints of somebody who is involved with drinking alcohol. In verse number 29, says there, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Now note this prohibition right here. He says, look not thou upon the wine. Now if we are not even to look at it, then that excludes drinking it. Don't even look at it, he says, when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Now, I used to run past that word till I moved to West Texas. We got Western diamondback rattlesnakes out there. I understand a little bit more about the danger of snakes and the stinging of venomous snakes. Praise be to God, I haven't been bitten. And in verse 33, he says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. Imagine, what's going to happen if you lay down in the middle of the sea? You're going to drown. Or, he says, as he that lieth upon the top of the mast, go up to that crow's nest in that ship, a very dangerous place to be. He says, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? And this is remarkable. I'll seek it yet again. If you're going to go through all of those things. You've got all of these wounds and redness of eyes and seeing perverse things and uttering perverse things and strange things. You say, you know, I want some more of that. That sounds pretty good. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter number five. That should be enough. But let's look at the New Testament just for a moment. In Ephesians chapter number five and verse number 18. Look at what the Apostle Paul here writes. And then we'll break down this verse just a little bit. He says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. Now, if you get into the Greek of that be not drunk, it is an inceptive 
verb. That simply means don't even begin the process of becoming drunk. But I want to take you over to Luke chapter number 12 because you'll actually see the word begin and that verb is mentioned in the same verse. In Luke chapter 12 and verse number 45, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus here says, but and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. So I'm delaying and shall, here's the word, begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken. That's methusko in the Greek. Same word that's used in Ephesians 5.18. The idea is don't even start the process of drinking. Well, what does that mean? Abstinence. Stay away from it. Don't even begin the process of inebriation. I think it's interesting. Sometimes alcohol is called spirits. But there in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18, instead of drinking alcoholic spirits, we need to be filled with the spirit. That's good teaching. Alcohol is a poison. I can prove that. I prove that from the Bible. You realize it's something that is not absorbed in the body. It's expelled. Write this verse down. We don't have time to go to it. 1 Samuel 25, 36 and 37. In 1 Samuel 25, 36 and 37, you have Nabal. He's a son of Belial. He's putting on a drunken feast. And he becomes drunk to the point that Abigail, I'm not going to talk to this man right now because he's so inebriated. And in verse number 37, you'll find out she goes to him after the wine has left. The alcohol left his body. It wasn't absorbed into his body. That's why it shows up in your blood stream. That's why you have a blood alcohol content if you consume it. There is nothing useful or helpful about its ingestion as it relates to physical or spiritual health. But then there's false news out there that claims, well, just a little bit is good. It's good for your health. You ever heard that before? You know, there was a, a recent study done. In fact, a news article dated July 29th of this year that challenges that and suggested that even low levels of alcohol consumption, note this, carry significant health risks. Friends, God knows what he's talking about. He is the creator of our body. He knows what's good for it and what is not. Let's look at this just for a minute. This one hits very close to home. A British study identified the three most powerful risk factors for developing dementia. And that's a problem in this day and age. You know what they are? Diabetes, air pollution, and alcohol. But there are some that try to escape the moral problem involved in alcoholism and they say it's a disease. I want you to think about this. It's the only disease on which billions of dollars are spent every year to encourage people to catch it. It's the only disease that some people personally or personally urge you to expose yourself to unnecessarily. If it is a disease which no one catches there or it is a disease that no one catches if he does not drink at all but which no one who takes his first drink can guarantee that he won't get it. The only solution, the only guarantee is staying away from it. Abstinence. So who's responsible for the plague that we have? Well, it's not the slobbering drunks. They're the worst advertisement for You go talk to a nurse. My mother happened to be one. She'll tell you all about the drunks. They used to come in there in the sorry shape they're in. It's not about those who are abstaining because they're fighting against it. It must be the social drinker. It must be the moderate drinker that can somewhat supposedly control their drinking, the one that glamorizes it. But friends, it's a huge problem. And it can strike at youth and cause so many problems as life goes on. But we could use similar arguments for other intoxicants. Things like nicotine found in cigarettes and cigars and chewing and vaping, marijuana, narcotics, fentanyl is running rampant in the world today. People overdosing constantly and causing so many problems, yes, even in their youth. So I must be selective and protective with what I put in my body and that begins in youth. But then the second one, sexual sins must be fled from. Go to Proverbs chapter number seven with me. Several places we could look at here. When I think about youth, particularly as they grow and they hit puberty, this can become a very serious issue. Parents, we need to be paying attention in Proverbs chapter number 7 and verse number 6, look at what Solomon here says. He says, for at the window of my house I looked through my casement. So you're, you're looking at him and he's looking out. And beheld among the simple ones I discerned among who? The youths. A young man, but he's got a problem. 
He's void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner. Whose corner? And he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him, here she is, a woman with the entire of a harlot and subtle of hearts prostitute. Why is he hanging around or going to where this woman's at? Note that it's taking place at night. He's already not thinking correctly. You go on and you look at all these things. She seduces this man. It says in verse number 21, with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield with the flattering of her lips. She forced him. He goes after her straightway as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasted to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. How many strong men have been wrecked by sexual sins? Where do they begin? I'm going to go to Matthew chapter number 5. One of the greatest discourses ever given by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is found in, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5 through 7, sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, 27, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Where did it start? First looking, then lusting. That teaches us as youth, as adults, as older individuals, we need to pay attention to what it is we're looking at, to control what it is we're looking at, because lust kills. You want a process for sin? James outlines it for us beautifully in James chapter number 1. As he talks about God doesn't tempt us, he says in verse number 14 of James 1, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own what? lust and enticed then when lust hath conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished and this is the only thing sin can bring is death and ultimately if not corrected eternal death Romans 6 and verse 23 we have to understand that one sexual encounter could result not only in disease but years of child support do we have a I'll use the word even though I don't agree with the word and what it's trying to do abortion we got an abortion problem yeah, we got an abortion problem. But you know what we actually have? We have a fornication problem. We got people that are having sex that have no business having sex, and thus you have children. What am I going to do with this child? Maybe you should have thought about that before you went into sin. That's right. One wrong compiles upon another, compiles upon another, and you just dig the hole deeper. We have to always remember that sex outside of marriage is sinful. It should be fled from. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 4. Marriage is honorable among all, on the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. I won't step on Genesis chapter number 39, because that's coming on a little bit later, but go study about Joseph. As he had opportunity to commit fornication, what did he do? He ran away from it. That was an appropriate response. Get out. But I can't leave this point without talking about this. Pornography is absolutely running rampant in society. Not only affects the United States, it affects the world. And it is ruining youth and beyond. Exposure to it is getting earlier and earlier and earlier. You know the best way to defend against pornography is similar to drugs. Never start. Never start. What does that mean, parents? It means we need to have controls in place where children can have access to this. Note what this article says. Opportunity for pornography viewing also predicts actual viewing. So as the opportunity is there, guess what else is there? The actual viewing. Youth with internet access on their phones or a computer in their bedroom are more likely to view pornography. In addition, pornography use is more prevalent among youth, note this, who are less religiously involved and who perceive less potential for condemnation upon discovery of their pornography viewing. What does that mean, mom and dad? That means we need to be talking to our kids. We need to have controls in place. We need to have filters. If they have access to a cell phone, you better make sure they don't have access to the World Wide Web full speed. In a longitudinal study of 648 adolescents, note these ages, between 16 years to 18 years, found internet pornography viewing to be a significant risk factor of the development of internet addiction. What is internet addiction? The use of the internet in a manner that is continuous and compulsive resulting in negative consequences to everyday life. Now listen to these statistics or this uh, study. 
Evidence suggests that excessive and compulsive pornography use has effects on the brain similar to those seen in substance addiction. In other words, it's like taking a drug. Note what else it does. Including a decline in working memory performance, neuroplasticity, a fancy word that simply means that the brain is rearranged by its use, reduction in gray matter. It means you get dumber. Magnetic resonance scans in adults have shown the brain activity of individuals who are self-perceived pornography addicts are comparable to those with substance dependence. Now, the same parents that would say, well, I, I would never put anything like alcohol or cigarette in front of my kid, protect them from drugs, you better be protecting them from pornography because it acts just the same and there's this thought that nobody knows and it can rearrange your mind so that when you get older in life it becomes a temptation. You don't want that. Youth is such a precious time. Once it is gone, it is gone. Children of the youth are as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Psalm 127 and verse number 4. Parents, how are we aiming our children? I hope it's toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot get our youth back, but we can certainly help our youth to avoid the mistakes that we have made. We can point them to the Word of God. And may our youth and beyond be used as an example of the believers. As Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 12. May God bless you and keep you as you strive to do His will. Thank you.